On this episode, I turn back the clock and talk a lot of wine. This is Gary Vay, Nerd Chuck, and this is episode 160 of the Ask Gary V Show. Nice rainy Tuesday. We're scoping on the Periscope. We continue to bring in friends from the Vayner Media family. Why don't you tell the Vayner Nation who you are and a little bit about yourself? My name is Melissa. I'm an associate copywriter, and I've been here for about a year and a half. And you're from Virginia. Very nice, like Andy K. Thanks for being here, Melissa. Uh, this is a very special episode because this kind of collides my two worlds. This is a very much a wine-themed episode. Uh, we ha- got reached out to by uh, some of the people on VaynerMedia on the West Coast. They're working on some client stuff for a really cool new show. Steve, actually, you know even more about it than I do. I'll rely on you in a little bit here. Oh, oh geez, we got it really in there. I know, right? <laughs> this is good. I feel uh, well, like India gets a lot of this attention. Right. Less, less so me these days. I agree. Yeah, we need to change that. Now that India's cut her hair, you'll be getting more of the attention. All right, Steve, why don't you tell everybody a little bit about what you know. Uh, Uncorked is an upcoming TV show on Esquire. Uh, If you guys are familiar with the Psalm movies, right? So this is based on those. So it's... So the show version of that movie that kind of hit really strong. Right, exactly. So You saw it? I did, yeah. Did you see it? Did you, Jesus, sorry for, the, sorry for the massively visceral reaction. Sorry that I offended you and asked you if you watched a wine movie. I get scared of Hocus Pocus. You're, you're scared of everything? You don't watch movies? I'm not scary ones. No, Psalm's not scary. Psalm was a wine movie. I you said Saw. No, not Saw. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. No, Psalm. Yeah, Got it. Did you see it, Stefan? You should. You need to get a little more cultured up, Stefan. It can't just be about basketball and hip hop. I, I know my shit. <laughs> Respect. <laughs> Very good. All right. So, so what we have here, I think, what I saw through the passing emails was we have multiple people that are starring in the show asking me video. Que- Is it all video questions? It's all video. How many do we have? Uh, six. Six. Awesome. All right. Before we go into the questions, we also. You and I work very closely on back to the wine theme, uh, a Skillshare right. course. Uh, why don't you, Steve? Let's get back into it. Oh, hi there. Uh, so, if you guys remember the old episodes of Wine Library TV, where Gary would do like the mystery box taste along, we teamed up with Skillshare, who's an amazing company that does online continuing learning courses. We did an amazing course with them for the last book as well. Yes. Um, and uh, we did a, a wine tasting course with Gary. That's all about how to be a better wine taster, how to be a better wine buyer in time for the holidays. Uh, and so you can go over to. Okay, Skillshare. good. Link, yeah. link it up. Link it up. Link it up. All right, let's get into the show. By the way, the Jets are very hurt. Very hurt. I'm. I'm very worried about Thursday. All right, go ahead. They're just hurt. So everyone's hurt. First question from Morgan Harris. Morgan Harris. All right, Gary. This is what I want to know. Given that wine is currently marketed relative to other alcohols like beer. Uh, liquors, what if the wine industry changed the conversation to market wine as a food? Um, food culture is huge right now, uh, and what if we got people to think about wine more as a food rather than just another alcohol? Great question. Morgan? Morgan. Morgan, great question. Uh, I think that's a really smart thought. Uh, I think you're barking up the right tree in general in marketing, and I'm going to try to make this show very valuable to everybody that watches it, and I know a lot of you are not wine enthusiasts, so I'll go very business on it. Using Morgan's main theme, I'm a big believer that you need to market things, uh, the value prop of things differently, and look for white spaces. That you, uh, a bottled water company, you're always talking about hydration and thirst and things of that nature, but maybe you start thinking about it for like how water's powerful for the brain. you got to find white spaces that bring value props to other products, and so if you start thinking about this like a food product, it might change the way people think about it. It's clearly, a lot more people eat food than drink wine, so I think it opens up the category. I I think the problem is, and I've thought about this for 20 years, I don't think you can pull it off. I I don't think you can get people to really understand that a beverage is a food or thinking about it. You can make it take it more seriously, a la coffee, a la wine. Uh, You see what's going on in brown spirits right now. We can make them, you know, think about wine in a more complicated way and a more, 
perplex way. The problem is that's where I think wine is. I think people actually think about wine more carefully than they think about food, which is in essence your point, right? If we can make people less intimidated about it and think of it as a more casual, as a standard within food. I mean, the way the wine business wants you to think is that this is always at the table when you're eating because then you've created more occasions to use the product and away you go. So I think, I think, um, I think it's the right thought. I think it's a far-fetched dream to think that you can get people to really think about it in a way that it's mandatory to as many use cases as we do with food, which is really the holy grail of that. But the interesting part of the question for everybody here is whatever you sell, whatever services you have, if you can make them think about it in a way that brings more value. For example, with VaynerMedia, I make people realize that our machine, our process works for anything. Not just selling stuff, but getting somebody elected, right? Uh, getting donations from a nonprofit. Like the machine can actually create any awareness around anything that can create a, a business result or an end result of your choice. Um, and so that's everybody's job in here. Like, how do you get people to think about your products in a different way? This. This used to be something you wore. Right, like it was, it was a functional item. You had tennis shoes, unbranded, and then over time, people came along and started branding it, and it went into a fashion statement. Right, and now it's a collector's item. There's a lot of sneakers being bought to put on a shelf and then trade. Now you've got the tennis sneaker in a 40-year window, going from just being a utility to play sports to or run or what have you, to them being a fashion category play and now a collector's category play. Three sections, hence why we sell a lot more sneakers in society today than we used to. That's a real life example. Well, that was good, I was happy with that. All right, let's move on. Back to the punchline on that. Because uh, I want to make my final point because I didn't see the whole thing through. Somebody had to think in the 70s and 60s like, wait a minute, these tennis shoes can be fashion items. Like for example, right now I'm collecting all the uh, like merchandise and, and ancillary things around Facebook, Instagram, and Snapchat and putting them away as collectibles because I think they're gonna be worth money because I think that's pop culture. So I think like a Snapchat pillow that they made like three years ago right now is not worth that much on eBay but I think is worth 500 bucks 17 years from now. You have to project. Like, the selfie stick, can there be a brand that's created, that's a Beats by Dre-like thing for the selfie stick? That's how I'm projecting, got it? So when I say the sneaker, you may think, well I sell posters, well what other use cases can there be? Like you gotta project. Sorry, good stuff. Yannick. Yannick, it's got some big guns. Hey Gary V, this is uh, Yannick Benjamin, sommelier of the University Club. My question for you today is, if you could be a sommelier at any restaurant in New York City, which one would it be and why? Great question. Hey, hey. Oh, great, great question. Uh, my choice would be Shake Shack. And <laughs> you, you like that? I love that. Thank you. And here's the reason: I would take it very seriously. I would pair with the you know chicken dogs and and the, and the cheeseburgers, obviously, and all the other things. Uh, the and I would take it. I would put out a ton of content. Um, I would really push Danny to like put the pairings on the menu for the cheeseburger and the hot dogs and different things of that nature. The chili, you could do some incredible stuff with that. And the reason I'd want to do that is because that's mass appeal. I, I, my passion for wine is to get as many people to drink it as possible. And the place where I think I can move the needle and bring people that are not in our amazing world together and caring about this product would be Shake Shack. It's at scale, there's a lot of locations, there's tons of asses on those seats on an everyday basis. And if I can get people to realize that great wine can be casual, uh, that would be very, very powerful. And I think I could have a lot of fun with it. I tend to be reverent in, in the wine space. I think that brand is, but it's clearly premium fast food and I think that's the right spot and so I think a very serious wine program uh, at Shake Shack has enormous potential uh, to really change wine culture in New York City and, and the world and I think that's very powerful and important and that's what I would want to be associated with. Good. You like that? I like that one, yeah. Thank you. Mason. So my name is Jack Mason. I'm the wine director of Marta Restaurant and my question is what do you think the impact of the recent news of Union Square hospitality moving away from tipping will have on New York in general or the industry as a whole? This is a really interesting conversation. Uh, 
Ben, uh, the CEO of Resi, an app I'm involved in, uh, had a great discussion with some thought leaders in the restaurant space around this. It's very fascinating. My, so I think Danny is amazing and always innovating and doing incredible things and I think it's amazing that he's doing something that I think really takes care of his staff and his internal culture. I think it's interesting. You know, I, um, I, here's my, this is actually not my general thought. This is my, one thing I do well in marketing is I don't think about what it, what I'm going to do and then think everybody's going to do that. It's been very successful for me. I try to think of the general masses. I have a vibe for that. It's not what I thought about Twitter. I, mean, I don't even like social media. What do you think about that? Like, I don't know. Like, if I wasn't in the marketing and business world, I don't think I'd be really using it. Like, I never took pictures as a kid. Like, there's no, why do you think I have no Throwback Thursday pictures? There's no freaking pictures of me in my life, mom. And so, that's a little inside joke of my mom. She made all mental pictures. Um, <laughs> Uh, so, so I think that um, I think that uh, I think that I personally am in a weird place because I'm still gonna tip cash on top of it because it's just in me. Like I was a stock boy that took out boxes and people gave me tips and it's so ingrained in me. So even though I know I'm paying 21% more or whatever it is, I'm gonna probably put more cash just because. And then I'm scared that that's gonna break the whole system because if people still arbitrarily do that, then what did you do? You just raised it 21%. But I think the flexibility uh, that it allows organizations, the way you can take care of people that work for you, which will then in turn create better service. You know, I also think that an interesting model could have been just raising the food prices uh, in general. I think that's a fascinating thing about the restaurant world. You know, the truth is, I really don't know. I, I think that um, I wonder for people that are. I think the economy's very good right now. I think if tomorrow the Wall Street cats are up to their no good and shit hits the fan, are people gonna be like, well crap, I don't wanna go there because I'm playing a 21% big and maybe I'm in 10% tip mode right now. Um, How do you tip, Steve? I pretty much 20 just by default. D-Rock? 25. Really? Yeah, I double the first number and then add like a few more. On any kind of bill? Pretty much. I'll do like 20% and then just go to the next dollar. Got it. Stefan? <laughs> They're my man. <laughs> Way to go honest. Yeah, I mean, but those are big numbers, right? Like those aren't 15, which is a lot of what people, older demo plays at 15. It, yeah. it kind of yeah. snuck up. Um, I don't know. I think it's a, it's a, it's a very intriguing model. Uh, it's forcing something on the consumer, which I think is fascinating. I think he has the brand to get away with it for the people that know. I think a lot of people won't even know, won't even realize. They'll realize when there's no line for a tip, and I'm curious how their reaction would be that they got forced into a tip. Some people get antsy when they're forced into a tip for six or more. So I, I don't know. I think it's very individual, and I think there'll be a lot of positive, definitely in the industry, uh, and there'll be some negative from the end consumer. For me personally, it's just going to make it more expensive for me to go to USB places, US, you know, those, you know, those places. So um, because uh, I'm going to uh, still tip. What are your, what are your thoughts, Dean? Um, I don't know. I, Do you I, know about it? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I'm very familiar with it. I don't know, like, I came up as an actor, so I know tons of people in the service industry. So, like, whatever ends up screwing them the least is, I, I think it's a huge positive. Yep. Um, it's kind of a scary situation to be forced to rely on what's obviously a subjective judgment call that we yep. just established in order to pay rent. I think the thing that everybody's going to worry about is does the service change, right? Like, to the right. people that hustle the most, um, that's a real challenge. I think Danny will pull it off operationally, but I think fast followers won't. And then you're not allowing the best servers to win, which eliminates meritocracy, mm-hmm. which then creates lowest common cur- courtesy and, and service. But, I mean, we don't have a tipping structure at VaynerMedia. I, mean, I get we it. We don't have to worry about, you know, the... I, I right? totally understand. Yeah. Uh, I think that's easily handled because you can just fire, right? Like, or, or you can just give raises. I mean, there's a, a lot of people always deploy that, well, we don't have tipping in our thing. Sure, you have other ways to like, you know, there's levers in all games, yeah. right? I think when, look, I mean, this, is, this gets into a unionized conversation. I was born in the Soviet Union. We've seen that play out at scale. It's really hard to suppress, you know, humans. And so, um, but, I, but the truth is, on a micro level, on a Danny Myers establishments level, I have enormous confidence that he can do it. I, I very much feel that I could do very rogue shit at Vayner because it's only 600 people, it's only 1,000 people, and whatever it's gonna be, that I could pull those levers at super scales when it gets interesting. Mm. Great. Next question from uh, Dana Geyser. Dana. 
Hi, my name is Dana Geyser. I work for Lauber Imports in New York, and I am a Master Sommelier hopeful. I wanted to know your opinion on the future of the Master Sommelier and uh, in reference to the proliferation of social media, bloggers, powerful wine critics, etc. Great question, Dana. I, Dana, I think you know much of what's going on in this episode, things have their moments. And right now, because of the movie and because of this show coming out, like people are paying more attention to Psalms and I think you'll have more people get into the game. We have way more. I run into Psalms and people that are aspiring to be master Psalms all the time because a lot of them started watching Wine Library TV when they were in high school or college, which makes me feel very old, getting on the 10 year anniversary of the show in February, which is insane. Um, and so uh, I think that, um, I think there's gonna be a moment here for the next 36 to 60 months that it's gonna be cool and respected more. I mean, look, if you were a chef in the 1970s or 80s, you were the help in America. Now you're a celebrity. So I think there's gonna be, I think there's gonna be an amazing opportunity. I think the, the bloggers and the social media things and things of that nature are just gonna amplify the awareness uh, of Psalms. I think Psalms have a lot of opportunity to review wines. One thing I wanna do, as a matter of fact, leave in the comments if you wanna do this, I wanna start sending Psalms wines from Wine Library and have them review on the 100 point scale and using those, I think their opinions matter quite a bit. And so I'm looking for more democratization at Wine Library on shelf talkers, not just Parker, Spectator, uh, you know, Galoni or me. I want like some of XYZ establishments. So I think um, that's one thing that I think you'll see more of. Uh, so I think there's gonna be a nice half decade here of more money for you guys and gals uh, for events and private tastings. And you know, the, when I was doing Wine Library and I was doing private tastings for people, I was the help. Like I was a retail store owner that I would come to your house and I would pour and I'm a bartender, right? And yes, I gave my thoughts a little bit. When I became Wine Library TV, Gary, people paid me $5,000 to come to their house and be the star. It was just a little bit of a shift of exposure and repositioning. No different than Bobby Flay compared to the best chef in 1970 in New York City. Help versus celebrity. I think Master Psalms are about to go through a really nice half decade. Great. Next, we have uh, Jane Lopez. Jane. Uh, hi, I'm Jane Lopes. I'm a Sony at Love and Massive Park. Uh, my question for Gary is with all the recent uh, press on Sony in the last few years, um, what do you think that's going to do to the industry, for consumers, for wine, for restaurants? Is it ultimately a good or a bad thing? Kind of similar to the last question. Kind of similar to the last question, Jane. I, I'll just, you know, it is what it is, the serendipity of it. I, 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 think it's a, I think it's a good and a bad thing. I think it comes down to you, Jane, and all the other people. With, with greater power and leverage, uh, money and exposure. I do not believe that money and fame change anybody. I think it just exposes who that person actually is. So, do I think more exposure around you, Jane, and all the other, your, your castmates on this show is good, bad, or indifferent for the end consumer? I think it comes down to you guys. So Jane, you might be awesome about it, right? You may have a bunch of young people, 16 year olds in New York going to the kind of place that you work at, you know, may ask you a question and look up to you and say, I wanna be like you one day and you could be encouraging or you could be a jerk about it, right? Like, like it's like, it's just how you play uh, this newfound exposure, fame, leverage, uh, people looking at you differently and so if you say that oh my god now I'm important and you become more douchey like that has happened in so many industries art music wine food well then that's bad for the consumer because now we're suppressing people if you take your your found leverage and you encourage people and and you use it to teach them about different wines and you get people to start drinking Chinon from the Loire Valley like my agenda was or <laughs> Portuguese wines or all this amazing thing well then you're doing a great thing for the consumer because the more different kinds of wines they taste uh, the more they're going to appreciate this incredible thing that we're all passionate about so um, I think it comes down to the individual psalm and so there's six, right? So right, so two of you may be incredible about it, three of you might be average about it, one of you might be a jerk about it, and that's what the net score is for the end consumer. Great, last one from Josh. So Gary, we need to know what wine will Henrik Lundqvist drink from the Stanley Cup when the Rangers win it this year? And will I be on hand to provide proper service? <laughs> That's an amazing question by Josh. Josh, great question, brother. 1994, Rangers winning the cup is one of the great days of my life. It was my first professional championship. So, But once my teams win, I stop caring. Uh, but I, I do have an amazing place in my heart. I hate being a bandwagon fan, but I always watch the Rangers in the last couple of years making their late runs in the season. Um, 
Good to see you're a massively passion fan. Clearly this was a fun way to end it. Uh, two things, no, my prediction is my prediction is you will not be on hand because there'll be an emergency in your business and you know the Psalm life and you'll have to be there. So you're gonna miss it, sorry about that. And I think Henrik's gonna go with Brazilian sparkling wine. I know that's a left field kind of thing but I'm very bullish on the Brazilian sparkling wine phenomenon. I also find Henrik extremely attractive. Which Is Henrik married? Can somebody check? I don't think he is, right? Can you Google that real quick before I get myself in trouble here? But, but, uh, but I, can, I can punchline this last answer is uh, because I think if Henrik is single, I find myself believing that he's spending time in Brazil and having fun where he discovered Brazilian sparkling wine and, uh, and that is why he is drinking it from the cup. You would have been there. You were supposed to be there. Yeah, he's but, definitely married. He's married, cool. So the different rationale to why he discovered his, <laughs> his dear friends who are Brazilians uh, introduced uh, the sparkling wine to him and, uh, and that's why he's gonna do it. Uh, the reason I wanted to say that is I really do believe Brazilian sparkling wine over the next 20, 30 years is a very interesting category that nobody's talking about in the wine world. Episode 160, mixing the, uh, the two worlds. As a matter of fact, I've noticed a lot of people asking for the question of the day, so I'm bringing it back. That's right, I'm bringing it back. And my question of the day is, what is your current favorite wine? Good way. It's almost like I brought back the wine library questions. <laughs> you keep asking questions, we'll keep answering them.